All right, everyone. So since we're coming towards the end of the year, I thought I'd do something a little bit different and list the 10 books I've enjoyed the most that I've read in 2022. And I'll include links to these books and videos associated with them in the description. These aren't books that were released in 2022, but they're books I read this year. First, Who Paid the Piper? The CIA and the Cultural Cold War by Francis Stoner Saunders. So at the beginning of the year, one of my big interests was deep politics. Reading researchers who have studied deep state operations and influences over politics. A very interesting topic in this regard is the so-called cultural cold war, where the CIA, in tandem with oligarchs and working through various front groups, directed massive resources into funding leftist magazines, journals and conferences around the world, but especially in Western Europe. They also promoted feminists like Gloria Steinem, abstract art exhibitions, and jazz musicians. The reason? They wanted to subvert leftism in the free world, away from the influence of Soviet-style communism. Creating a new left which focused more on individual expression and the avant-garde rather than class struggle and economic conditions. They did this through the so-called Congress for Cultural Freedom, which extended American cultural influence to 35 countries. In the words of Saunders, there were few writers, poets, artists, historians, scientists or critics in post-war Europe whose names were not in some way linked to this covert enterprise. And this book was the main source for my video, The Cultural Cold War, the CIA and the Congress for Cultural Freedom. With help from my occasional editor, Censored Anon, this is probably the best produced video that's on my channel, so I encourage you all to go watch it and see the extent of American influence on the post-war European left. Tribe by Sebastian Junger Why did mental disorders disappear in cities being bombed during World War II? Why did suicide go down in communities in Northern Ireland during the Troubles? Why did so many survivors of the brutal Siege of Sarajevo said it was the most meaningful time of their lives. In this short book, the author looks at our deep need for collective belonging and tribalism, a need which is denied by modern civilization with its emphasis on individualism. The author goes through history to show how collective suffering in times of war provides a great source of meaning and happiness to those involved, because what these events have in common with our older tribal life is the low differences in status and sharing of resources, a feeling of collective suffering and care. Younger also takes a look at the phenomenon of PTSD in soldiers returning from war and examines why the US is probably the worst possible society for them to return to. And he also talks about the military's so-called brotherhood of pain, where soldiers are united by their circumstances and provided with clearly defined roles and again links this to our deep-rooted need for tribalism and collectivism. There is a base need for some kind of communal unity and shared purpose with others that's innate in us, but this need is ignored by most people in the West today to our psychological, emotional and physical detriment. I do have a criticism of this book, which was surprisingly popular for a book covering some of these themes. It was, I think, a New York Times bestseller. Uh, but I do have a criticism, which is the author somewhat naively implies that in times of tribalism, divisions along other lines like uh, race disappear. Uh, but this book could easily be bolstered by something like a, a book I'll mention later, like the, the Nations book or some of the uh, stuff I've covered in my Sociology of Nationalism series. But even just the, the basic socio-biological insight that people feel greater empathy and affinity for people more genetically similar to them. And so ethnicity as a group of shared kinship and forms of collective meaning and understanding is really the most accessible and innate source of what Younger is describing after immediate family. But despite this oversight, some of the examples Younger provides of our deep-rooted need for tribalism are very interesting. And I discussed some of these examples in my video review of The Road earlier this year. The State of the Nation, Ireland Since the 1960s by Desmond Fennell. So I read this book recently on the recommendation of uh, someone who runs a Telegram channel called Archiving Irish Diversity Stuff, which 
is a great source of historical material uh, around Ireland, stuff you, you won't really find in other places. Now, the book is by the somewhat forgotten nationalist intellectual Desmond Fennell. Um, maybe it's not totally accurate to call him a, a nationalist, but he's certainly of the right, broadly. And he wrote a lot of cultural observations about Ireland, and he was one of the few intellectual critics of the Irish embrace of liberalism. Now, in the intro to this particular book, Fennell writes that, quote, the history of Ireland in the 20th century has been that of a nation, long deprived of its nationhood, trying to regain it and becoming stuck halfway. The book itself consists of five chapters, but each could be a standalone essay itself. Fennell is really good at deconstructing a certain kind of cosmopolitanism in the Irish psyche that verges on what Roger Scruton termed oikophobia, aversion to the familiar and the rooted. And he takes aim at popular Irish media figures that he thinks exemplify this, like Emma Dunphy and Gay Byrne. And he also offers some theories of his own on why Ireland embarked on this process of what he calls denationalization. One of his insights is that the ongoing conflict in the North, combined with the media very unfriendly to the nationalist perspective, began to bring a great sense of shame associated with Irishness and Irish nationalism and the whole history of the uh, freedom struggle in Ireland, uh, it began to bring that sense of shame from the 1970s onwards. And feeling hopeless to stop the ongoing violence, Irish people developed a strong desire to do something, to do anything to affect change. Fennell says this prompted a desire for a scapegoat, which under the direction of the Dublin media, would become the church. But the church itself doesn't escape criticism in this book either. Fennell talks about how bishops and priests began to bring shame on the history of the Irish struggle and their denouncements of violence in the North, and also complains of how during periods of radical social change, the church made little effort to offer an alternative, instead being brought out by the media mostly to just condemn the IRA, stress their non-involvement in politics, and be shown to be arguing against things like contraception and divorce, thus denying people their human rights. Fennell also laments the failure of Ireland to develop a humanist critique of liberalism, or its own philosophical tradition at all, after the achieving of independence, failing to build on the fertile soil left by people like Douglas Hyde, Yeats and Pierce. Again and again reading this book, uh, I was not in my head recognising certain insights I've had about of Irish history and the Irish mentality, some of which I couldn't quite put my finger on, but Fennell identifies them with precision. I think it's something of a shame, reading this, uh, to think that so many second-rate minds are wheeled out as public intellectuals in Ireland, and then there's a man like this that uh, didn't get more of a voice, and, you know, I myself only discovered him recently. But it does open up a really interesting avenue to me in looking at 20th century Ireland through this piercing lens that is coming from a, a much different perspective to the one offered by official Ireland. So I'm looking forward to reading more from Fennell. Only the World Was Enough, Brendan Sims. Now this is a book I had read parts of before, um, but it's only this year I decided to listen to the whole thing through as an audiobook actually. And it's surprisingly engaging, normally I struggle to pay attention to audiobooks, but uh, even though this is quite long, it's a very interesting read. It also goes under the name a Global Biography. Now, there's obviously been thousands of books and articles written about what's arguably the most significant figure of the 20th century, uh, but Sims, who's an Irish historian, he offers a somewhat new interpretation where he draws heavily on the man's own words, letters, and early speeches, and he traces the development of his worldview from his experience in the First World War. So I guess what separates this biography is how much he focuses on the ideology and the, the thoughts and, and development of, of the thoughts of the people involved. And Sim's version of the man is one who is occupied by one great concern throughout his life, which is the rise of Anglo-American capitalism as a force that would subdue and destroy Germany and really all of Europe and turn all nations basically into vassal states for this sort of unstoppable force of finance capital. 
and this is so, somewhat against the standard historical interpretation that he was extremely focused on Marxism, on Bolshevism, um, and that this was what drove him. But Sims believes that he saw Bo Soviet Bolshevism as a lesser threat in the long run, believing that communism itself was merely a tool for international finance capital to weaken and destroy nations. Uh, secondly, he was very concerned about the equality of the German people, uh, believing that the Anglo-Saxons, especially the Americans, possessed a superior stock of people. And he realised the gravity of this when, in the First World War, he saw descendants of German immigrants fighting on the other side. So he was occupied with a concern for German inferiority. And Sims focuses on uh, the aspect of the positive eugenics that he wanted for the German people uh, rather than just negative eugenics. And this is another thing he thinks uh, historians have overlooked somewhat. So these concerns, together with his reading of geopolitics, which focused a lot on space, uh, living space, and the experience of the First World War, where uh, Germans starved due to lack of food, uh, these concerns led him to believe that the world was destined for an ultimate showdown between a German-led European empire and the United States. And he believed that only a German empire with as many inhabitants as America and a much expanded landmass through living space in the east would be capable of overcoming this powerful force of Anglo-American capitalism. And Sims, following other historians, also shows that the NSDAP took its commitment to socialism quite seriously. And he argues that much more sweeping socialist reforms were planned when the war was finished. So this is a much more nuanced and comprehensive uh, explanation for the ideology that was driving the events of the mid-20th century in continental Europe than is usually offered uh, by biographers for this period. Uh, and it definitely changed my thinking on the motivations and worldviews of the people involved. So, yeah, it's quite interesting because it's not just a, a dry history of, of events and uh, dates and geopolitical happenings. But he's always very focused on the ideas that's driving this and how these ideas develop and sort of uh, disagreements that exist at the time and uh, how it's played out. Nations by Azar Gad. So this is, of course, a video I covered in my video titled Nations, Their Long History and Deep Roots. It's also the title of the book. And it's written by an Israeli historian who wades into the sociological debate around the origins of nationalism. Now, as you may have noticed if you follow this channel, this is another topic I became quite interested in this year, is the sociology of nationalism, the sort of prevailing academic interpretations of nationalism, and uh, criticisms of those other positions on the origins of nationalism, how far it dates back, if it's this modern, top-down phenomenon, what the basis for it is, why it became so prominent when it did. And this is definitely the best book I read in the sociology of nationalism. So in that series, I covered a book by a guy called Walker Connor, which criticized academic confusion around nationalism. And the book, The Construction of Nationhood by Adrian Hastings, I also covered that. That criticized modernists from a historical standpoint. Hastings was a historian. And it showed that modern nations already existed by the Middle Ages, before any industrialization or mass literacy. But the reason I chose Gath's book is because he puts together all of the big criticisms of the modernist viewpoint into one very well-researched book, and he includes insights from sociobiology, which those other books don't do. He includes anthropology. He has a deep critique of the methods of the modernist school and, you know, some of the sort of biases and motives uh, that influence that. And most of all, he has a sweeping history of, of the world from the standpoint of ethnopolitics. So Gatt's main insight is that the debate around the origin of nationalism is confused because the definitions for nationalism are usually too precise. You know, what counts as a nation? What counts as a nationalism? And defending what he calls the traditionalist perspective, Gatt shows that even if nationalism was not something conscious to people until modern times, ethnicity was always central to politics right up to the present day. Gatt shows that the very first states and civilizations were built around a conscious ethnic core and that multi-ethnic empires throughout history were typically in fact 
empires which were seen as primarily belonging to and serving one foundational ethnic group. One of the best examples being the Egyptian Empire, where Egyptians always had a very real sense of Egyptian identity and kinship, even when their land was divided. Unlike modernist scholars who focus almost entirely on Europe, Gad also looks at ethnic states across the world, the best examples being Japan and China. In my opinion, this book is a fatal death blow to the modernist argument that nationalism is a new top-down phenomenon with no organic basis. And it will continue to be useful just in the wealth of historical examples that he's provided. Uh, but of course, if you want to know more about it, you can watch my video on it, which I'll link below, because there I have uh, an hour and a half uh, discussion, uh, really sort of diving deep into this book. And I do encourage people to check that out. Thinking Being, Eric Pearl. This year I decided to include my supporters a bit more by starting a book club available to people who support me on Subscribe Sarah Gumroad. And the first book we covered was Thinking Being by Eric Pearl. And I chose this book because after reading it this year, it had quite a big impact on me and making me look at classical Western philosophy in a completely new way. To the point that I thought going through this book would be the best way to cover individual ancient philosophers. On the book club, we did a show on each of the main thinkers that are covered in this book. That is Plato, Aristotle, Plotinus and Thomas Aquinas. And Pearl sees in each of these thinkers a thread that carries on, a conversation that begins with the pre-Socratic philosopher Parmenides, who proclaimed that the same is for thinking as for being. That's the title of this book. In other words, what this means is that being is just that which is intelligible to consciousness, and consciousness is just that which apprehends being. So the two are coextensive, and there is no sharp dualism between the mind and the world. And Pearl says that it's this claim that is not only the basis for classical metaphysics, but this is what makes any metaphysics possible. In Pearl's words, quote, the only alternative to Parmenides' insight that the same is for thinking and for being, the insight which is metaphysics, is the postmodern and nihilistic notion that reality itself is a construct, a myth, an illusion, that there is no such thing as reality. So it's this collapse of metaphysics and of the good faith in our consciousness to commune with reality that Pearl believes leads to modern nihilism. Uh, this is a view I've come to share. And to me, it's much more powerful than the Heideggerian or the Nietzschean explanations of nihilism, which blame metaphysics itself. Now, in some other interesting insights, Pearl argues that Plato never posited a world of perfect forms or as the forms existing in some other realm, but instead the platonic forms are just the identity or the whatness or essence of things. He also argues that Aristotle is a Platonist whose theory of forms doesn't actually differ very much from Plato's at all, and that Thomas Aquinas is best understood as a Neoplatonist whose philosophy, including his conception of God as pure act, is closest to the Neoplatonist philosopher Plotinus underscoring how much of Catholic philosophy in this medieval Western civilization was influenced by the ideas discussed. Pearl sees Aquinas as the culmination of this rich tradition of classical metaphysics. And if you want to hear our book club discussion of this book, uh, I uploaded our discussion on Aristotle uh, to YouTube, which I'll link below, and you can sign up to subscribe to Sarah Gumroad to listen back to all of the episodes we did and you can, of course, take part in the future discussions yourself. Defragmenting Modernity, Paul Tyson. Defragmenting Modernity is Paul Tyson's attempt to condense the insights from the field of post-liberal theology in an accessible way and deal with the origins of the meaning crisis of modernity. His argument is similar to the one I just mentioned from Eric Pearl, that it is our severing of thought from being, our loss in the belief that objective being and meaning can be discovered through thought that is at the root of nihilism. Tyson follows post-liberal theologians in tracing this severing to a series of theological disputes in the Middle Ages which overturned classical assumptions about the nature of being and would eventually fatally sever the connection between being and thought. This severing has meant that we have lost the ability to speak meaningfully about meaning. 
And we do not any longer believe that things like values can be ascribed to objective reality. And so instead, values, morality, and fundamental questions of meaning have been confined to the realm of subjectivity. This subjectivizing of fundamental questions has also coincided with a growing faith in scientific progress and empirical verification as a test of objectivity. And so while our postmodern minds are unable to consciously adopt a meta-narrative or system of beliefs around value, we tacitly adopt the values of technological and scientific progress. Liberalism, which rejects the possibility of reasoning about public goods or ends of man, instead insists on a purely negative conception of liberty as an end in itself. And now, with the many modern political ideologies of emancipation uh, coinciding with this time of unprecedented technological progress, we seem to be tacitly adopting transhumanism as the means of ultimate emancipation. And Tyson believes that only by going back to the beginning and reviving the ontological conception of things that informed classical philosophy can we hope to reverse the many harmful trends in thought that have filled the vacuum of metaphysics today. This is a great primer on the origins of the modern spiritual crisis and much more accessible to a general audience than some of the more dense stuff that gets written by theologians and philosophers on this subject. And this is also another book we covered on the book club this year. And we actually had the author himself, Paul Tyson, come on to discuss it with us. And uh, it was a very interesting discussion. So again, you can check that out in the archive of shows. The Philosophy of Plotinus by William Ralph Inge. This is another secondary book on Platonism I read, not really knowing anything about, but I ended up being captivated by the writing style, and that's really the main reason I've included it. Because as well as a great exploration of the worldview of Plotinus and Neoplatonism, purely in terms of writing style, this is uh, one of the best books I've read in any genre. And it was only after finishing it I researched the author somewhat, William Ralph Inge, and discovered that the Anglican priest was in fact nominated three times for the Nobel Prize in Literature. So I was happy that that somewhat confirmed my biases. And even though I haven't read anything else by him, uh, I can see why he got these nominations. Inga makes the worldview of Plotinus into a compelling, even uplifting story. On every page you can feel his deep reverence for the man, who he treats as a great spiritual master rather than just as a philosopher. There isn't much more I can say in this book, really, without just going through the contents and explaining the philosophy of Plotinus. So instead, I'll just read one of the passages. The end of the soul's pilgrimage is the source from which it flowed. All life consists in a home stopping, a journey forth, and a return. If the outward journey were considered an isolation, we should have to say that it was not willed but necessary. If, however, we take the whole course together, as we should do, we may say that creation was the first act in the drama of redemption, for the soul only realises itself in the desire, the travail pangs, which draw it back towards the source of its being. The Sovereignty of Good, Iris Murdoch Iris Murdoch was a writer who was best known for her novels, but this is a collection of three essays she wrote related to moral philosophy. The essays build on the theme of a defence of Plato's conception of a form of the good, Murdoch criticizes prevailing moral theories which only focus on people's outward behavior. For example, Immanuel Kant believed that the best case of moral action would be someone doing something that they did not want to do purely out of a sense of duty. But for Murdoch, what one's inner orientation is, is far more important. Murdoch defends the platonic view that there is an ideal, super-sovereign form of the good that we need to posit to understand a wide range of things that fall under this concept. The good can never be grasped in purely descriptive terms, and instead it requires an inner transformation and a qualitative experience to grasp. The good isn't some set of rules, but something which we should orient ourselves to. She uses the analogy of learning a language, which requires respect toward an established structure that transcends ourself, as well as sustained effort, love and dedication. Orientation to the good is a process of unselfing. In this sense, Murdoch follows Platonists in seeing truth and beauty as means of approaching the good, and this is why she offers a powerful defense of art as a means of contemplating the good. <laughs>
nature and art allow us to see the world beyond our own selfish concerns. When we take selfless pleasure in the pointless existence of animals or lose ourselves in the contemplation of art, these are activities that unself us and orient us to the good. Murdoch was one of a handful of philosophers who defended a more classical account of virtue ethics at a time when it was very out of fashion in the 20th century. This book, Attacking Trends in Analytic Philosophy with a defense of a sort of Neoplatonist perspective on ethics, seems strangely out of place for its time, but it's a very interesting read. Man of Nature, Syed Hossein Nazar. Followers of this channel will know that I engage a lot with traditionalist school thinkers. Probably the best living exponent of traditionalism is the Muslim philosopher Syed Hossein Nazar. His book Man and Nature offers a traditionalist perspective on nature and ecology. He draws heavily on the great religious traditions from Christianity to Taoism to present the traditional integral view of nature as sacred. While the modern worldview treats nature as a mechanism, the traditional worldview saw nature as a living organism. And although Christianity was at first very hostile to pagan reverence for the natural world, Nazar traces how the traditional perspective of nature as sacred was integrated into medieval Christianity through the maintenance of Gnostic elements, the synthesis with Platonism, and the inspired work of mystics like Meister Eckhart. He also traces how this view was lost in the West, looking at developments in Christianity, the scientific revolution, and the enlightenment that led to the desacralization of nature, destroying this integral view and creating the Faustian urge for endless expansion, which has now put us at odds with our natural environment. While today the left is offering humanist secular forms of environmentalism, and the right too often slips into a reactionary defense of the excesses of industrial capitalism or individualism against these narratives, this is a great presentation of ecology viewed from an illiberal, pre-modern perspective. Although himself a Muslim, Nazar ultimately argues for a return to a more mystical Christianity as the solution for the West that is now embarked on this Faustian path. Thanks for tuning in. And although I expect to post more content before the end of the year, I will take this opportunity to say January 2nd will be four years since I started this channel. It's been an interesting journey. I've made some friends through this project, I've lost some friends. It hasn't always been fun, but it's always been worthwhile. And I really appreciate everyone that has supported me and this channel uh, throughout that time, especially people who have been generous enough to support financially. I wish you all a very happy Christmas, and take care.